My name is Severo Ornstein. I'm a computer scientist, but I'm also an amateur musician, and my father is a composer. For years, I've watched him struggle with the problems of writing music down on paper. And I've known for many years that we could use computers to help, but until recently, we haven't had powerful enough machines. Over the last year, a student from MIT, John Maxwell, and I have been working on this problem, and we've produced the system which we're now about to show you. In order to make it quicker to put music in, we hooked a synthesizer up to the computer so that we can play the music directly into the machine. We also have to be able to enter music by hand, but that's slower, just like writing on paper. The sound that the synthesizer makes is not the most wonderful, and we've not focused on the issues of performance at all. We only use the sound as a man means of proofreading to check the scores that we create. The emphasis is entirely on the scores. Now John will demonstrate the system for you. Mockingbird runs on a special high-speed computer called the Dorado. This is the Dorado's terminal, and this is the keyboard through which we communicate with the Dorado. This is a special pointing device called a mouse. Notice that as I move the mouse around, the cursor moves around on the screen. We've also attached a synthesizer, which Severo mentioned, through which Mockingbird can go both record and play. Let's look at the piece of music currently on the screen. This is the piece of music that we played for you earlier, Bach's Little Fugue in G minor. What you see on the screen is not the entire piece, and we can bring up more of it by scrolling up. This is the second page, the third page. We can continue rapidly scrolling through the piece like this. There's another way we can obtain a view of the entire piece, and that's to jump to an overview. In this overview, we have a rough sketch of the piece, which is composed only of the beams and the stems. The composer can find his way around in this in two manners. One is by looking for the beams and stems in a rough pattern that he's recognized before, or by playing from a particular section, which I shall do. I'm listening for a long trill that I know is in here somewhere. When I find it, I can jump back to the main score at that point. There it is. And there's the long trill I was talking about. It's a half note tied to a whole note tied to another half note. Let me play that for you. When I'm through with this piece, I can name it and store it. Later on, if I want to look at it again, I can call it back by name. Let's turn now to a piece that demonstrates a point I'd like to make. This piece of music has four parts in it, or voices as we call them, in spite of the fact that it was written for piano. Let's look at those parts. Here's the first voice, which is a melodic line that runs along the top. We can play this. Running in parallel to this is a series of seven tuplets followed by triplets. There are also a couple of voices that appear and disappear throughout the piece. If I play the entire piece, you should be able to hear the voices. Now the reason these voices are important can be seen in this measure over here. This measure has three voices in it. First of all, there's the melodic line that consists of these two quarters. Then there are the triplets that beat against it, which are down here. Then there's an inner voice made up of eights here. Now we know that these are separate voices. First of all, because the quarters are stemmed up, and second of all, because the inner voice is beamed. But the computer doesn't know that at all. In fact, if it wasn't told better, then it would think that this eighth note should occur a quarter after this quarter note, because that's what a quarter note means. In fact, to get it to play correctly, we have to tell it that these eighth notes are in one voice and these quarter notes in another. We'll see the importance of this when we turn to reading music in from a synthesizer. 
Let's see how one might record music from the synthesizer. To do that, we first select an area that we'd like to record into and hit record. Severo. This is a time plot of what Severo just played. If I hit playback, the computer will exactly mimic his keystrokes. I can manipulate this uh, time plot as well. For instance, I might want to take this section down here, through here, and insert it right here, like this. And also, I might want to delete sections, like this. Now that's gone. If I play this back, the computer will play it as if computer, uh, Severo had played it on the synthesizer. This way the composer can take snatches of different ideas that ha he has and paste them together into a co coherent piece. We've seen two completed scores. Now let's build one from scratch. To do that, I first select an area and then record into it. This is a time plot of the music that Severo just played on the synthesizer. We'd like to convert it in the score. The first thing we have to do is make sure that all the notes are properly lined. If we look at this note right here, we can see that it's slightly off. Now I could pick it up and manually move it over to where it should be, but I'd rather have the computer make its best guesses about where it thinks it should be. The way I do that is I select the entire score and issue the command and the computer brings everything together within a certain tolerance. The next thing I have to do is beat in some measures to give the computer reference points on the score. The way I do that is to play back and beat in measures. Ask the computer to put the measure lines right up in front of the notes that they think it's in front of and check to make sure they're all right. I see that one of the measures here got slightly misplaced and so I'm going to move it over. Now I'd also like to insert a measure at the beginning of the piece. The way I do that is I pick up a measure line from this menu. The way I pick up any object from the menu is by sliding the cursor over like this until the uh, cursor's icon correctly matches the object that I want and then release the menu like this. I can then insert the object that I want. That's the only measure I want to insert, so let me get rid of the icon. Now I'd like to insert a time signature and a key signature. To insert a time signature, I point to an area and tell it I'd like it to be in 3-4 time. See the time signature there. To indicate a key, I select the entire piece and tell it this in the key of G. 
Notice that the appropriate accidentals have appeared over to the left, and that all the F sharps have disappeared from the score. Let's put the note values in for this first measure. What should the note value be for this first note? I've just selected by turning gray. You might suspect that it should be an eighth note, because it's approximately an eighth note's distance from here to this note. But this note is not the next note in this note's voice. The next note in this note's voice is way over here. And the value for this note should be a dotted half, like that. We can continue with the melodic lineup here. This should be an eighth note. This should be an eighth note. That should be a quarter. These all should be 16th, and all should be beamed. If I want, I can move this beam up, like that, and tilt it. These notes should all be quarters and recorded. Now, should be on the second staff, place them down. Same with these. These are on the second staff, but they're eighths instead of quarters. I think I'll move this beam down like that. I need to tell the computer how this information, or how these notes are voiced. So I select all these notes, say those are all in voice one, and say that's in voice two. Everything else is left in voice zero. Finally, I need to insert a rest in front of this voice. That should be an eighth rest. Now I could continue in the same manner with the rest of the measures, but I'd like to have the computer's help. Before I can get the computer to help me, however, I'm going to have to voice this for it. So let's run through and put all, take all the notes out and put them in voice two. All these notes here belong in voice two, plus these chords. Voice two. All this melodic line belongs in voice one. Oops, got the wrong note. Go back for that one. Those are all in voice one. And everything else is left in voice zero. Here's voice zero. As long as I'm here, I'm going to put all those on the second staff. Just make it look pretty. Now that I have it voiced, I can ask the computer to make its best guess as to what it thinks the duration of those notes are, which it'll do now. And there's this guess. Let's look at each voice separately. Look at voice two. We see it consists of a series of dotted half notes. These are all fine as I, best I can detect. Let's put the stems down. Look at voice zero. Look at this measure right here, and we see that it consists of two quarter notes and an eighth. What it's missing is a rest right up in front of here. Would have been nice if the computer had told me that. In fact, if I'd asked it, it would have graded this measure for me, which I'll do now. See, it complains by graying this measure, and notice that this measure is not gray over here. Take the gray away and insert an eighth rest. Turns out this pattern is repeated throughout the piece, so I'm just going to insert a bunch of eight thrusts real quick. And now I'll ask the computer to check those measures. No complaints. But in fact, there's a mistake down here this measure in the bottom. The reason it didn't catch that there was a mistake was that the notes add up, although they don't add up in the right proportions. This note here should be an eighth, and this note should be a quarter. Let's look at voice one. Hmm. First thing I would do is put all these stems down. This is a, a little bit 
cluttered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the computer to make its best guess about how it thinks these things should be. i do that now. Now it's easier for me to see where the mistakes are. If I look at this measure here, see that there's a 30-second note that shouldn't be there. So I'll just make all these 16ths. Same with here, this should be a 16th. Um, this measure looks fine. Go on down here, that looks fine. Um, best I can tell, everything else looks fine. Let's ask the computer to check. So he complains about this measure down here. The reason is, I didn't notice, but this quarter should be tied over to another 16th here. So I'll do that now. Make that a 16th. Beam that all with that. And tie those notes together. I can move this tie as well if I want. So now we fixed all three of the voices. And we look and look at them together. And all the information that the composer wanted to put in the piece is there, but it's not very pretty. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask the computer to um, place all the notes in an aesthetic arrangement by asking it to justify. When it justifies it, it'll do three things. First of all, it'll align all of the voices so that the notes that occur together will be uh, on top of each other within the measure. Second thing it'll do is it'll space things aesthetically according to approximately according to the rules that are used in publishing houses. And the last thing it'll do is it will make sure that there are an even number of measures on each line. Let me do that now. And we can see now that that looks fairly pretty. I could make some minor aesthetic changes, like tilting these beams, to make it look better. But for the most part, it's in a form that the composer could print and keep as a record of what he's composed. We can, in fact, play this piece now. And when it plays, it'll play from this representation of the score. Oops. What I need to do is uh, change the metronome marking here so it won't play it quite so fast. There we go. And now we'll play it. Now this is not the only way that I could enter music into our music editor. For a composer who doesn't normally compose at the keyboard, he might be interested in uh, entering music directly. Let me demonstrate that. I'll scroll up so we have some empty space, and then start inserting some notes. First thing I do is I put down a measure line, and then start putting in notes, approximately where I think they should go. It's clear that this is slower than writing down music using pencil and paper, but there's still a number of advantages to capturing music this way. The first is, once we have the music in this form, we can change it. If we want to change a particular note, or insert a measure here, or uh, change the, the spacing of the justification, we can all do that quickly and print out a new copy of the score. Um, the computer can also be our proofreader, can play it back very mechanically so we can find mistakes. And last, we can always obtain quickly a legible copy of the score, something that somebody else can read easily. Now, this chord, in fact, is repeated twice. I don't want to go through all that again. I avoid it by looking at that voice by itself and copying the chord over, like that. In fact, if I wanted, I could co copy even larger sections. Like, for instance, I could copy uh, these four measures here into that section, like that. I'll now delete that because I don't really want it. Going back to here, these are these weren't quarters; they were eighths. And there was a couple more notes up here. There's a E flat that goes there. So it's recorded. If I wanted, I could put that chord on the second staff, like this, but there are a lot of ledger lines, so I'm just going to leave it up in the first one. I'll beam these together, and 
I will move this beam up just to make it look pretty. Last thing that this voice needs is an eighth rest in front, like all the rest. Look at all the voices. And uh, if I inserted a few more measures, then I could ask the computer to justify that measure to make it look prettier, which we can see it's done right here. It's also moved this one down. Now, if the composer had written this piece for two instruments, say the flute and piano, he might want to print out just the flute part by itself. We can do that just by looking at the flute's part by itself and then changing the staffing. Now, the composer could just print this and give it to whoever might play the flute. Here, I printed the flute part by itself. If we compare it with the screen, we notice that it's exactly the same. I've also printed the entire score. And the same holds true for this. We have a version of the printing that's a twice density, showing that we can print things other than what's on the screen. In addition to printing music at different densities, we can also print music at different sizes. For instance, this piece of music was printed on a Versatech plotter. We've gone through one example carefully, and now we'd like to go through another quickly. To do this, we've already played in the piece, beaten in the measures, and divided in voices according to hands. And now we're going to take it the rest of the way to a completed score. First thing we want to do is look at one of the voices, put everything on the second staff, Make all the notes sixteenths. They're not really, but we'll make it for now. All the stems down. And let's run the beamer over that. There we go. Let's put in a time signature of 4-4. Four, four. Put it in the key of G. And we're done with that voice. We look at the other voice. Put everything on the first staff. Have it guess for us what the, the note value should be, and then run the beamer through that. Now, when I said a moment ago that everything wasn't quite 16th, that was because there are a few notes at the very end that are different. So let's go to the end of the piece, jump to the overview, look for the section we're interested in, and jump back into the score. Okay, now you can see that these notes here should be quarters, and these notes should be halves, and those should be holes, and that we should insert some quarter rests into the score here and here. One of those quarter rests should be put in uh, the different voice. Okay, now if we go back to the beginning, um, we can Justify, which will make it look all nice and pretty. And we're done. It took us that little time. We can play it back now so you can hear what it sounds like. That's it. Now, if we wanted to, uh, we could justify this at a, at a slightly less dense system, like this. Or if we didn't like that density, we'd even make less dense than that. We've seen the general thrust of how Mockingbird works, so now I'd like to show you some special features. 
In order to do that, I brought in a fairly complicated piece of music. In particular, look at this chord right here. The chord has four accidentals on it. Now, the composer didn't have to decide where those should be placed at all. The computer did that all automatically. In fact, if I pick up one of these notes and move it down to here, then Mockingbird will rearrange the accidentals automatically. This measure down here, uh, the composer may have decided that he didn't like how those notes were spelled. So he could go to the menu and decide to change some of the spellings. For instance, he might make the first flat a sharp. Or he might want to make some of those uh, sharps flats. He might also decide to make uh, a note a double flat if he chose, like that. I'd also like to show you how we make uh, end tuplets down here. Uh, to do that, first I'm going to take away these end tuplets. To make an end tuplet, we first select a number of notes, decide whether or not we want it beamed, and then give uh, the end tuplet. I can repeat that. Over here, I'll make an end tuplet without a beam. Oops, wrong well, note. Let's move the beam up. There are still a few more features that I'd like to show you using this new piece. First is that you know that you can uh, play back music like this. What you can also do is play back music at twice speed, which allows you to rapidly scan for mistakes, like this. I heard a mistake. Once we know approximately where the mistake is, we can uh, indicate a starting point and play back at half speed, which allows us to listen carefully. And there was a mistake. So we can fix it, bring this note down to where it should be, and uh, play the section again, showing that it's been corrected. Another thing the composer might do is add a new voice by playing against the computer. To do that, we'd first prepare the score and then play against the computer's rendition. Here are the notes that I just played in. Let's make these all quarter notes, stem down, except for these two, which would be eighth and beamed, and this one, which would be a whole. To look at the entire score, we can justify it and play from the score. If, in fact, the composer didn't want that voice, having heard it, he could just delete it from the score, and it'd disappear. If the composer wanted to transpose the first three measures, what he'd do is he'd first select those measures, like this, and then transpose it up to, say, a flat. I could change the key signature to match as well, but I won't bother. We can now play this back, and you can hear the transposition. If he didn't like that, he'd always transpose it back. Now, the composer can also insert embellishments pretty much wherever he pleases. For instance, I'd like to put a mordant on this note way over here. To do that, I go to the menu, pick up a mordant, and put it in the note. I'd also like to make uh, this note down here have a trill. And again, I go to the, the menu for a trill, and place it there. Mockingbird understands about these symbols and will play them if we play this, the score back. The composer can also insert music directly into the score. To do this, we first prepare the score and then select an area into which we would like to record. We can now play this back.
Well, that's the system in its present form. We still have a few features to add, but by and large, it's now ready for use. We hope some composers will be using it over the course of the next year, and perhaps the system eventually will find some use in publishing. That remains to be seen.